What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 234 at block height 644,875 on Saturday, August 22nd. So what is shaking today, Janine? Well, what is uh, shaking is my desire to ever eat vegetarian ice cream again, because uh, this is not what I expected. (laughs) This is not what I want. (laughs) You committed a mortal sin. I think your Bitcoin card is going to have to get revoked. I'm also uh, kind of uh, shaking with laughter at the fact that, you know, despite getting so much praise for the stories they wrote using the NSA revelations, uh, the Washington Post has decided to put an opinion piece saying that Edward Snowden should not get a pardon because they are dipshits who have no shame. Yeah. That's been an interesting thing uh, in terms of Trump hinting at pardoning Snowden, just in terms of both, uh, obviously, uh, Assange and Ulbricht coming up uh, everywhere I see it pop up at least, but then just like who exactly is like instantly going, no. Yeah, I mean, um, why would you bother to pardon living people who are actually suffering under the current so-called justice system when you could pardon a woman who's been dead for 114 years. Yeah, uh, that was obviously just a campaign season humor. (sighs) In better news, uh, Julian Assange's partner has already raised tens of thousands of dollars for his legal defense fund in England after only a day or so. That is encouraging. Well, I should say tens of thousands of pounds, but yes. Ah, man, my brain, it's just, I I can't even banter right now. I am just so flabbergasted at the the first stupid thing. Yeah, let's talk about the asteroid. (laughs) What a a perfect way to die. I'm ready. Yes, the 6.5 feet diameter asteroid. It's going to kill everybody the day before the election. Oh my god. It's going to break apart into pieces and conveniently conveniently hit the uh whatever machines they use to calculate the vote. That'll be great. Nah, it's gonna break up over DC as celebration fireworks when Trump wins again. <laughs> well, yes, Doomsday would be a celebration for that crowd, you know? Alrighty though, I, I I feel like I just have to exercise this entire stupid situation out of my brain and just get it done with. Yeah, speaking of the other asteroid, and by that I mean roids in the ass. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, two days, or no, three days ago now, um, Samurai Wallet made a public announcement that they had found two critical vulnerabilities in Wasabi that they had disclosed to ZK Snacks, um, the company, and that uh, communications had broken down between the two teams. So they were following through with their ultimatum to just publicly disclose things within two days of informing um, ZK Snacks of the critical vulnerability. And uh, yeah, it's been okay. a stupid shit show for the past three days. So so communication broke down, has it? That mm-hmm. that's very new. I, I was not aware I was not aware that communication had broken down, you know, just looking at Twitter over the past year or so, you would never get the idea that these two 
can't work together. Yep. But, um, yeah, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, no point beating around the bush. Um, this is not a critical vulnerability. Um, I think there's actually an argument to be made that this is not even an issue, um, period. Although, um, I wouldn't personally make that argument, but, um, it, pretty much it comes down to the coin selection in Wasabi when you queue, um, UTXOs to go into coin joins. Um, this algorithm is deterministic. Um, if you feed the same inputs, it's going to order them as far as which ones to put into the mix first in the same way. Um, and Samurai's entire argument um, about this being a critical vulnerability boils down to the fact that if you somehow magically knew all of the UTXOs in somebody's wallet already, and more importantly, um, exactly which ones of those that they had currently queued to go into future coin joins, um, you could track those outputs um, to the, the future remixes that they were doing. So you would be able to isolate those remixed UTXOs to a single future mix round and reduce the anonymity set to just that round. Now, the problem here is um, you have to first magically know all of the UTXOs in somebody's wallet. And again, I like to stress this, exactly which ones they currently have queued to go into a coin join mix. And then, yes, you can do that. The issue is um, that is only ever really going to happen if you are taking a big UTXO and pushing it into a Wasabi mix um, to break it up and then immediately re -queue all of those new broken up UTXOs and only those UTXOs for remixing. Um, so don't do that. Solved. And the second issue um, relates to unmixed change um, in terms of the, the way Wasabi works with their fee schedule is they kind of tick down um, the value of the, the mix UTXO um, to let users shave fees off and then reset that periodically. So a Samurai's argument is that <clears throat> if you just, you know, break something up and add all of it, including the unmixed change to go into a remix, then after a point, um, in order to keep remixing, um, the, the mixed UTXO is you need to make up the, the fee difference when that amount resets. And so, yeah, just don't, do that. You shouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, but yeah, th this issue um, pretty much requires magical psychic knowledge of an individual wallet's UTXO composition and then exactly which UTXOs they have queued for a mix currently um, to be able to do any of this. And the the one situation that I can practically think that occurs is, you know, you break in a big UTXO into a mix and then immediately remix all of the child UTXOs. So just don't do that. And now the part that's really greasy here um, is their recommendation to Wasabi users was just don't use the coin join feature of the wallet at all. Um, which is obviously going to hit um, ZK Snacks revenue if, if a lot of users were to do that, rather than just explain to users, um, don't do that thing in this one situation, which tells me, um, in, in my mind, Samurai doesn't give a fuck about Wasabi users. Um, they don't give a fuck about you know, people being able to use the tool they want to stay private as safely as possible. Um, they're just trying to fear monger people into not using it at all. 
and therefore hit a competitor's income stream. Um, so like, that's just incredibly deceptive and greasy. And I mean, really, you know, what this comes down to is in this fringe case of somebody dumping a UTXO in that gets broken up and immediately remixing all of these, um, this could potentially be a viable attack. So just don't do that. Like this is not a critical vulnerability. This is being so absurdly blown out of proportion. It's ridiculous. Like, <laughs> and like, frankly, the, their release today um, from the samurai team going into the details, it's the most ridiculous over the top thing ever. Um, just pretty much trying to make itself look like a white paper to create an air of authority when all of this boils down to you magically have to already know all the UTXOs in a wallet and which ones are queued in a mix for this to mean anything. Well, so my only question is, because um, obviously they ch tried this out themselves to see if they could do this in the wallet. And my only question is how, like, if you had a couple of parties who are using Wasabi Wallet and doing this deliberately where they didn't care about the privacy or anonymity of their own coins, they were just doing it to mess up the anonymity set for others. What is the potential impact of that? Your anonymity set would be slightly degraded um, by the proportion of people doing that. And they all have to pay fees to do that. So it incurs a cost. And I mean, that just kind of boils down to um, anonymity sets degrade. You can't stop that. When you engage in protocols like this, if other people in that protocol do dumb things, um, your privacy will degrade accordingly. That's just how this works. So, like, ultimately, um, you know, it, it would be a nice step for Wasabi to introduce um, more randomness in the selection, maybe even um, more time delays or time randomizations. Uh, so that users wouldn't have to consciously, um, you know, account for this or introduce this. But it's it's really just this simple. Um, if you dump a big UTXO into Wasabi, do not immediately requeue every child UTXO of that for remixing and you're fine. Just do one or two at a time introduce a little bit of a, a delay, turn the wallet off periodically, and issue solved. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I have to say, not even specifically about this situation, but just the general climate, uh, is that it continue to continues to annoy me, especially given, you know, the fact that over the last couple of weeks, I have seen some snide comments being like i know that you know samurai wallet and wasabi have not gotten along for quite a long time still don't really know what really started all that and why it had to go this far so know that um they uh clearly do not like shinobi very much anymore even before he made the disclosure last month but um, also, I've just seen general comments about the podcast and the fact that they probably don't like it anymore. And I honestly don't give a shit because I see those comments and I'm just thinking, you're not, you're not winning any favor. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not convincing me that you're someone worth defending. I'm going to continue to highlight actual development that is going on development that will help people get better privacy in Bitcoin. I'm going to keep doing that, whether that involves people that they don't like, people that they don't agree with. If they have a disagreement, um, they should handle that like mature people and not go into mumble chat rooms and talk about how they have absolute, absolutely no respect for other people working on privacy tech with <laughs> like you have to to get to that point um that's very extreme and i am just increasingly frustrated with all of this and 
I, I just I don't know what to say anymore because the it, this all bothers me and now the fact that they're making attempts to malign both of us when I have, have tried to do my best to do, at the very least just stay out of the shit and on the other hand and just you know share interesting stuff that is happening in that space and, and you know whatever i'm going to keep doing that i'm not going to pay attention to the snitch fit on twitter anymore because it <laughs> it drains time that could be used better by me and a bunch of other people more wisely i don't want i, I don't that i probably that's the last time i'm going to comment on this because i'm getting tired of talking about it i'm getting tired of reading about it I'm getting tired of wasting other people's time who has to listen to me saying this. So I'm I'm done. Like, you don't like the podcast? Don't listen. You know, don't read my stuff. I'm going to highlight the good work that people are doing anyway. And I don't care if, if <laughs> I, I don't care what you have to say if all you're going to do is waste people's time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's just really, I don't give a shit. You want to be butthurt? Go be butthurt. But my issue is the lying, the deception, the constant false framing, the manipulative bullshit. Like, here's one thing, um, and I'm probably after this episode going to tag them on Twitter at this point. Fuck it. Um, a lot of the samurai people, T-Dev, Keon, um, love to go around and, and scream about how Wasabi um, gets people arrested and point at BitClub. Well, um, I'd like to see them, you know, show me the lines in the indictment, in the, the affidavits, in the evidence, in the, the court proceedings where chain analytics um, had anything whatsoever to do with BitClub getting busted. Not the fact that they were openly engaging in securities fraud, um, running a Ponzi scheme out in the open, well known for years on the SEC's radar and were dumb enough to conspire criminally in unencrypted Facebook chats and emails that the Department of Justice was able to subpoena. So I'd really like to, to be shown in, in all of those, those court documents and evidence where Wasabi and Chain Analytics came into that because they really love to go run around pointing at that screaming how Wasabi got people arrested. That's called lying. I mean, I honestly, like, I don't think we should tag anyone. Like, all we're going to get is more snide little comments on Twitter that oh, come up in my, my feed. And, yeah, but it's like, I'm just going through my day. I'm literally trying to get people's attention on cool stuff that people are doing around this technology. And I'm just looking through Twitter and I see shit talking about something that I'm doing, not mentioning me directly, but shit talking something I'm doing, interviews that we're doing with people, and it's like, go away. Like, <laughs> like get get to work, get your own work done. Um, but if you're, you know, if you, you're, if <laughs> I, it's just so confusing because I don't think that I've done anything wrong necessarily to deserve that. What? Like, is that how you make friends? Is that how you att want to attract people to this stuff? Is that, is, is, do you want your users to go on social media and see that that's how you spend your time? Like, okay, I'm going to divert people away from that because what we're, what's going to happen, the number of people that I've heard say, I'm not going to use either of these clients. I'm not going to engage with, Yep. the these privacy techniques because i literally don't know which side is because like i think to some degree they understand like the the fact that they published a like on technical explanation of this disclosure or attempted to like they know that most people don't have any clue what they're talking about they have no idea how to distinguish who's telling the truth so they're going to look at all of this and be like well this side is accusing the other side of being whatever nsa agents or something this other side is saying that they're getting people arrested and it's like okay um well yeah i don't know what to do about that so i'm just gonna use neither you know 
not not going to use either because like that's too complicated for me like that's the situation you're creating there will be a few people who may just be smart enough to be like fuck both of you the stuff that you've built is fine i'm just going to use both i don't care about your shit talking let's go but a lot of the people who don't know how the hell to how the hell to distill what you're talking about are just not going to engage that's the effect that this is all having and that's not the effect that I want to see. I want more people to be using this technology because guess what? If more people don't use it, it doesn't work. If you're using strategies that don't get more people to engage, you're literally handicapping your product. So, yeah, I am trying to stop you from doing that. <laughs> you don't have to thank me or anything. You don't have to thank all the other people who are trying to tell you to stop doing that. Um, I mean, literally, I will I will quote what Jameis Lop said, because uh, someone asked, why is there so much drama here? And he said, well, joining coins is an intimate activity. And that perfectly <laughs> reflects the fact that a lot of this debate almost just feels like two, you know, what's what's the word? <laughs> two former lovers who get into a spat and just hate each other for really silly reasons that they haven't gotten over with but they're going to get back together eventually or just eventually stop talking about each other behind each other's back all the time that would be great but yeah that is what's happening people and i don't i don't want to talk about this anymore so let's move along all righty so in other news um Join Market, a coin join client uh, maintained without stupid, petty bullshit and drama, uh, just dropped a uh, new version 0.7. Um, and this is pretty nice. Um, so first up, um, there's a one-click executable for Windows clients now, which for reasons beyond my understanding is still a very popular operating system. Um, they have a, uh, a new refactoring in the back end to have PSBT support. Um, so that's going to be a, a really nice uh, debt load remove going forward. And also, they have implemented sending support for BIP78 uh, pay joins. So the, the new BIP spec um, that was worked out for the BTC pay integration. Um, and also Wasabi supports. So from this point on, um, all join market clients will um, be able to actually negotiate pay joins with both of those clients and accept the, the URI and the BIP, um, but they can't receive them yet. And so um, until the next major version, uh, join market's still supporting their old um, join market spec uh, pay join implementation. But when they uh, get around to implementing the receive uh, functionality for the new BIP78 version, um, they're going to deprecate their old spec and just shift completely to that. Um, and also just, uh, you know, a few simple backend tweaks. Um, most of you guys really won't care about, uh, but yeah, get out there, uh, get mixing. I don't hear you mixing. Yeah, I'm just uh I'm just uh, counting down the days to when join market joins the love triangle. You know. This whole love triangle going on with the privacy wallet fighting. We shall see. Probably never. But so you said um cuz I didn't I I looked at the release but um I didn't notice that they said you said they were going to deprecate the other implementation of pay join um yeah but they're waiting until they get the receive side functionality for the new spec first because uh this is only uh supporting sending with it uh do they give like a particular reason for why they're doing that because um the way i understand is that this pay join implementation is like it's more like merchant oriented it's like if you're going to use it to pay for things whereas the other implementations or the previous one that they or the existing one that they had and also the one that samurai has is more oriented towards peer-to-peer -to -peer stuff so is there like a reason why they're deprecating it 
Uh, well, there's no real reason why you need like a merchant setup uh, to implement 78. Like you could use this with peer to peer wallets. Um, but it's it's probably just they got the send functionality um, and it worked and the uh, the old just ship it and, and we'll get to it later. <laughs> I mean, like all, all you really need is the, the Tor endpoint. And as long as the wallet supports setting that up when you're on to receive, you know what I mean? Alrighty though. Uh, next up in privacy land. Sorry, everybody. The Tor project is blockchaining itself. Ah! Gotcha. Stop lying to everybody. Nope. So on August 18th, um, they did not do that, but the Tor project published a blog post titled How to Stop the Onion Denial of Service, um, in which they discuss the difficulties they've had dealing with denial of service attacks. Um, so it starts off, as you may have heard, some Onion services have been seeing issues with denial of service attacks over the past few years. The attacks exploit the inherent asymmetric nature of the Onion service rendezvous protocol, and that makes it a hard problem to defend against. During the rendezvous protocol, an evil client can send a small message to the service while the service has to do lots of expensive work to react to it. This asymmetry opens the protocol to DOS attacks, and the anonymous nature of our network makes it extremely challenging to filter the good clients from the bad. Uh, but then their so end quote. Uh, but then their proposed solution to this right now is an anonymous token system. Uh, they says you, they say you can think of anonymous tokens as tickets or passes that are rewarded to good clients. In this particular context, we could use anonymous tokens as a way to prioritize good clients over malicious clients when a denial of service attack is happening. Uh, an additional benefit of a token-based approach is that it opens up a great variety of use cases for Tor in the future. For example, in the future, tokens could be used to restrict malicious usage of Tor exit nodes by spam and automated tools, hence reducing exit node censorship by centralized services. Tokens can also be used to register human memorable names for Onion services, which would be a really great thing, because if you've ever seen the um, Onion addresses, dot .onion addresses, they are not human memorable um and they can also be used to acquire private bridges and exit nodes for additional security now before you all start hyperventilating that tor is blockchaining itself um they say of course when most tech people hear the word to 2020 their mind directly skips to blockchains while we are deferring the blockchain space with great interest we are also cautious about picking a blockchain solution. In particular, given the private nature of Tor, it's hard uh, finding a blockchain that satisfies our privacy requirements and still provides us with the flexibility required to achieve all our future goals. And of course, they realize that you can do tokens without using a blockchain, which many people have unfortunately Woo! not, uh, they have not realized that yet, unfortunately, despite many failing and failed projects to do so. Um, but they do want to use a proof-of-work system. So they say, in particular, Onion services can ask the client to solve a proof-of-work puzzle, therefore allowing entry. With the right proof-of-work algorithm and puzzle difficulty, this can make it possible for an attacker to overwhelm the service, impossible for an attacker to overwhelm the service, while still making it reachable by normal clients with only a small delay. Similar designs have also been proposed for TLS. Uh, and then they say, we've already started working, we've already started writing a proposal for this system with the great help of friends and volunteers, and we are reasonably confident that existing proof-of-work algorithms can fit our use case while providing the right level of protection. And then the proposal that they link to in this paragraph is a post by George Kadianakis on June 22nd to the Tor dev mailing list, um, kind of giving some giving a write-up of what that system would look like using proof-of-work tokens, which, by the way, people, um, uh, as you may have seen in a very uh, hot take thread a few weeks ago, um, yes, proof-of-work has been around for a long time. There was a, uh, well, as, as a word, proof-of-work, um, I can't remember the year the paper was i think it was 1997 or 92 i can't remember um adam back did not invent proof of work as someone we should remind people 
but he did invent a thing called Hashcash, which which ended up being a very important project for highlighting the use of proof of work, which was in email clients to prevent spam. So this is not a new thing. Um, the fact that they're doing this doesn't surprise me. And yes, you do not need a blockchain. Proof of work does not have to have a blockchain. Tokens do not need to have a blockchain, but they are still useful for things like this. Yes, this... Uh... Yes, not just just beyond the excitement I am feeling seeing a project like this realize that you can do just tokens. It's amazing. But like this would be a perfect like both of these would be solution for these types of scaling issues with Tor. Um and until something better comes along, um you know, at least to really use it privately, um Tor itself is kind of a scaling bottleneck um, indirectly for Bitcoin. So th this would be awesome. And it's like you can compose all of these things like so ridiculously. Like you could just have something tied to the directory authority um, centrally issuing tokens or handling that. Um, you know, you have the, the dynamic proof of work um, for actually connecting to a service, you could have proof of work itself used to generate tokens to some degree. And all of those are just dynamic knobs that can be turned on the service side and the user side. Like a service starts getting spammed, crank up the token price or crank up the proof of work difficulty. Like I, as a user, can overbid that if I want to get through an attack going on right now in terms of doing more proof of work or paying more tokens. And it's just like, this is the exact kind of like throttling valve for this type of shit um, that Tor is needed because it's like, you, you can't just blacklist IP addresses on Tor. Everything's anonymous and onion routed. So like this, I would really like to see this, um, you know, become a, a priority and start moving forward in terms of what the, the devs are actually working on. So exciting. All right. So you ready for this weird one, Janine? Yes. What is it? So uh, th this actually happened back in June. Um, and I'm not sure whether this is an article typo or um, there were second arrests uh, made on the 18th of this month or just more information released. But um, Ukraine busted three men um, who laundered $42 million in ransomware and other proceeds through 20 um, bucket shop exchanges. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there, there were three guys literally operating 20 bucket shops, um, that were used to funnel ransomware, uh, gains into fiat. And apparently they even distributed some ransomware themselves. Um, but really the, the interesting thing here is, um, this was all kicked off by this project, the Bulletproof Exchanger project um, from Binance, which is just an internal company operation. And pretty much um, the whole point of the project is to identify these high risk um, exchange services where stuff like this is going on and um, not just you know, incorporate internally for their own risk management, but Binance's team for this actually proactively reached out to Ukraine and Ukrainian law enforcement and passed an entire profile of um, data on this network of bucket shop exchanges um, that led to an arrest and a roll up of everything in three months. And so like, this is not just an exchange complying with subpoenas or, um, <laughs> you know, dealing with requests. This is, they, they effectively um, took their risk management in-house 
and turn that into doing police work, which they then proactively turned over to law enforcement um, and led to this network being busted. So, um, yeah, that's a thing that Binance is doing. You know, like, when does that creep into, like, individuals just loosely associated with transaction graphs um, having proactive reports to the police made about them? Mm hmm So, yeah. So what's up with this uh, corporate migration to the mountains? Well, um, I just find it interesting given the the kinds of companies that, uh, as is also mentioned in this article, have um, filed for public stock offering in the last month or two. It's been quite interesting seeing the kinds of companies that have been doing that. Um, and one of them, which I uh, try to keep tabs on, and apparently some people uh, at Palantir like to keep tabs on me because they follow me on Twitter uh, is uh, going to be relocating or they have already relocated to Colorado instead of Palo Alto which is where all of them seem to uh, base out of and so NBC reports that the uh, well they describe them as a data analytics software company which is putting it mildly because if you look at everything that they've done like predictive policing stuff, um, uh, working with ICE and everything. Uh, let's just say that they are more like a private version of the NSA. Let's put it that way. So they have over 2,500 employees globally. And NBC reports that they are relocating their headquarters to Denver, Colorado, from Palo Alto, California, uh, which apparently they confirmed on Wednesday. The company has updated its website where it now lists Denver as the site of its headquarters. It also updated its social media pages to reflect the change. Uh, Palantir had also announced early July that it filed confidentially for a public stock offering. And oh, some people are asking, well, why have they decided to move? And Chief Executive Officer Alex Karp, uh, they quote, has been open in the past about a potential move in an interview with Axios, which is basically a PR, uh, mm, not really sure. They kind of, they basically just push out PR pieces. Uh, on HBO in May, said he was against the increasing intolerance and monoculture of Silicon Valley and was nearing a decision on whether or not to move. Carp said at the time Colorado was under consideration. Uh, and before I get into why that comment is interesting, I'm going to also quote Peter Thiel, who obviously founded this whole thing. In fact, Palantir, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, was an offshoot of PayPal because he basically took uh, some of the fraud detection software or other that PayPal was using in the early days, and he decided to make Palantir. And then he sought, you know, investment money from CIA's uh, venture fund, as one does, uh, and then proceeded to be uh, basic, basically have the CIA as their client for a number of years, as one does, um, things like that. And so Peter Thiel says, we have to figure out ways to make housing more affordable in these places. When people start companies, they're typically getting paid in equity and not a large salary. The way rent and housing costs have gone through the roof in a number of cities where people go to start companies is a tremendous problem zoning rules while well-intentioned have had had the effect of making it almost impossible to take a pay cut and make a leap now while that comment is uh entirely true i just find it interesting that he cares about something like that being who he is and the kind of stuff he works on um yeah so what do you think may be the real reason that he wants to get out of Silicon Valley? Because my impression is uh, I don't feel like Palantir is exactly the kind of company who would not fit into the monoculture of Silicon Valley because the monoculture of Silicon Valley is is surveillance capitalism or more accurately surveillance and how do you pronounce it? Cantillian, cantillianism? Cantillianism? Uh, 
Yeah, that, well, I, there's like an extra eye in there that I think is not supposed to be there, but whatever. I think that's more accurate. Kind of people have been applying that also to the monetary system. But yeah, anyway, you get the point. Um, yeah, I don't see how exactly Palantir would not fit into that space because they're they're very successful at doing exactly what Silicon Valley companies do, which is earn people's private information into commodities and make tons of money off of that and basically become private forms of the surveillance state. So what exactly is he talking about here? I mean, my read on this is it's just the bottom line dollar. Like if he makes this move, can bring cost of living down. It's easier to hire people, to retain more people, to grow a workforce. Like those kinds of costs would probably really compound in a place like San Francisco really quickly. And, um, you know, our, isn't uh, like Palantir pretty much going public right now? So I'd imagine uh, yeah. that like, growth is definitely on the, the short-term horizon in terms of business plans. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it would also not surprise me if uh, part of the decision was the fact that a number of people who work at Palantir may not want to live in California for much longer given all this stuff that is happening because they would like to maintain their lifestyle and they may not be able to do that with as much ease with what is going on in California. So, yeah. Um, and also, regular reminder, um, just to make this a Bitcoin story, there is a former Palantir person uh, working as the chief security officer at BlockFi. So, you know, those, you know, interest payments that some of you may be getting, I hope not, but for anyone who might be listening to this, uh, those interest payments that you're getting, the money that you have given to BlockFi is being carefully managed by someone who has... Uh, not only worked at Palantir, has also worked at, what was it, um, the FBI, the, uh, what's the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, what else, Department of Defense, yeah, very, very safe hands. Um, so I hope you are enjoying those interest payments because apparently they got millions of dollars in uh, investment in the last couple of weeks from some major crypto influencers on twitter we you know i mean fuck it if there's gonna be an nsa privatize it free market man <laughs> all righty are we ready for shinobi to nerd out i don't know i don't know if people can handle that much longer nerd so um richard myers um from gotenna and some others have uh, created a proxy app called FL Digi Proxy um, that hooks up uh, to FL Digi, a program to control radios through software, and hooks up to C Lightning so that you can have <gasps> Lightning Channel communications over ham fucking radio. Remember, remember how Rodolfo. Made that payment to Elaine, like I think a year or two ago. Oh yeah, there there is now mm -hmm. a software stack to just fucking hook shit up like that, and um yeah, this is fucking dope as shit. So um obviously very variable in terms of power and the frequencies you use, but the default settings for the proxy um pretty much set up a really low bend with a uh, long distance com link um and they ran a test between um san francisco or no san jose and uh michigan um so two thousand miles and uh yeah uh, it took about 15 seconds to decode a message somewhere along the uh the length of a a very short uh invoice and um yeah like ultimately uh it's it's kind of uh bottlenecked here in the sense that like actually setting up a channel um and processing a payment over really long distances could take about five minutes for like a payment process it's about 
I think like a thousand bytes to actually negotiate that back and forth. But, you know, you can bridge that gap with a lot denser nodes. Um, and ultimately, hey, uh, if you are in a situation where you don't have any other options, um, five minutes to cheaply move a, a lightning payment off chain um, doesn't really seem like that bad of a trade off to me. And I mean, like, honestly, this, uh, this could really start just making the abstraction layers of Bitcoin's network topology really fucking wonky. Um, you know, like, let's say you have two regions, um, where radio is the only way to communicate. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't set up some bridge channels over ham radio like this and just somebody can make money bridging those two isolated networks um, over ham and just kind of settling those things out over the course of a couple minutes. And, uh, you know, you could even go so far as to distribute like block headers or Merkle proofs for things and pay for that over lightning um, through this. Because, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of all the messaging apps using it, but you can just pass general messages um, through lightning channels. Um, it's pretty much just a, an onion layer um, or an onion routed network. Um, so, yeah, like this, this is really fucking cool in the sense of you can bridge connectivity over the lightning network you can derive uh, another source of block headers to check um against if you were using you know something like the blockstream satellite feed as a source for that and um yeah we need much much more things like this uh, that allow Bitcoin to be used when things like uh, the assumption of internet access start getting a little sketchy. Because, uh, yeah. Censorship resistance. Alrighty, though. Shinobi radio rant done. Uh, next up, uh, LND has just dropped the 0.11 beta, which is bringing Wumbo support. So LND has finally caught up with C Lightning and Eclair um, in removing the 0.16 uh, channel limit that was still being enforced. So uh, yeah, I am really kind of interested to see because LND is one of the most widely used clients on the Lightning Network, how this really starts affecting channel topology um, and just the overall network graph. Because, you know, unless you were competent enough to kind of hack this into LND yourself, um, you've been just kind of sitting there with your thumb up your butt waiting or um, having to move to a different client. So, going to be kind of interesting how that plays out um they've also updated the autopilot heuristic to kind of look more i don't know how to put this simply um look more at the paths and their intersections um that you could route payments through with different nodes rather than directly at how connected individual nodes are to try to have a, a less gameable autopilot heuristic. Um, also set up a new uh, backend ETCD for the database storage. And the neat thing here is this allows you to kind of have uh, replicated databases in different places so that you don't uh, wind up having to use static channel backups and be forced to close channels out on chain if you were to suffer a database loss. Um, so that is a really nice thing for anybody running core nodes or routing nodes trying to make money or services. Um, that could wind up getting really expensive if your database got corrupted and you had to close everything out on chain. Um, and then also... Um, they have a new um, API function to intercept uh, HTLCs um, so that you can kind of have some other process or, uh, you know, application check some condition before actually forwarding or, uh, you know, do neat things like 
open a channel on the fly uh, to finish routing a payment. And then they have a similar um, hold function for the key send payments, which is you just sending without an invoice to a node. Um, so let's say if you just sent me a key send and I'm operating some service, um, I could kind of grab that before my node settles it and then make sure that I'm actually able to provide that service before I settle that payment. So that way um, I wouldn't have to issue a, a refund or anything if I couldn't or if some item was out of stock. But, um, you know, mostly just, uh, you know, a lot of improvements uh, for people actually running infrastructure on top of stuff and more and more, um, you know, moving more in that direction of like modular access and hackability to things, which I've kind of harped on for a while is like their biggest weak point. But uh, yeah, if you feel like taking risks with beta software, uh, go. No Wumbo cheer for me, Janine? Really? What? How do you do the cheer? Wumbo! I don't know. I, I just made that up. Mumbo, wumbo, jumbo. Mumbo, wumbo, jumbo. Alrighty. And then um, this uh, we touched on last week, but uh, Strike has launched their uh, Strike Rewards program for cash back. And uh, pretty much the, uh, the whole gist of how this came to be is in the process of... Uh, you know, um, Bitcoin moms and uh, Bill's shop uh, using Strike to accept money, uh, you know, as a cannabis dispensary with all those banking problems. Um, they still kind of had friction in terms of encouraging people to use Strike. And so their processing fees could be anywhere from 5 to 15% because cannabis businesses just get screwed like that. And so they started offering five to ten or five to ten percent discounts in prices um, if you paid with strike. And they saw a massive uptick in terms of customers, you know, willing to download strike and use this. And uh, so they're rolling it out as the uh, you know an overall thing with a few businesses. And um ah, man. See, so me and Mr. Hoddle's uh, shirt store, uh, Bit Refill, and Crypto Cloaks, um, anybody using Strike to pay there will get 5% cash back. And the uh, Lightning Network based uh, Fortnite clone, Light Knight, um, anybody using Strike will get 15% cash back. And they're going to work on pretty much trying to expand um, to other businesses. I'm assuming crypto specific businesses as well um, in the coming weeks. But um, I am not going to lie. I literally, um, me and Mr. Hoddle had no idea that he was going to do this. And um, Jack is, is just doing this. Like this is not coming out of uh, any kind of cash back from us as a business. And so I really don't know what to say other than like fucking thanks, man. Cause uh, like I just got a, a ping that this was a thing now right before he pushed this publicly. So uh, <laughs> yeah, Jack is a uh, real fucking stand up guy. So do you have to be a strike user to get? cashback or is it just anyone who pays to a to a store using strike um yeah you have to be a you know a strike user with the app and anytime you go to these stores um and pay with strike you'll get the uh, whatever percentage cashback in um usd in strike well let's just say that that five percent is the cost of doxing yourself to strike <laughs> well um or it's the incentive to. Well, I mean, you know, that is what it is, but I just, uh, I just gotta say on a personal level, like, I appreciate that because he just did that and, um, that could potentially drive business our way. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. 
Well, all I can say is that I've never encountered a privacy-preserving cashback program, so, you know. Well, I mean, it is what it is. Like, Strike is a little lightning bank, you know. You know, it's... That really, you have to change the laws or find, uh, you know, little thresholds and ways that you can indirectly get out of things. But I think, uh, I don't know. Or I'm just keep your privacy. I'm even wrestling with this myself, but uh, I think a lot of people in this space are going to get very disappointed at how many people are willing and comfortable with using um, things like that in the coming years. Oh, I've already been disappointed for a number of years, and that's not going to change my strategy to not that. Well, you know, I'm just willing to put out there, if you are comfortable with that, I am totally comfortable with accepting your Bitcoin for silly swag. This is true. Alrighty, though. Uh, what is up next with something finally moving into a proper release soon? Yeah, so I can't remember. God, I should have checked, but I can't remember which episode up on sometime in June. But um, Luke Childs has been working on a automated BIP39 recovery tool for Electrum since June. Um, and you can see if you go to the pull request that I tweeted out and will be included in the show notes, uh, you can see like a little demo video of how it would work. But Basically, if you have a BIP39 seed and you're not quite sure which wallet you generated on, you're not quite sure if there's any Bitcoin there, or maybe you imported it into a different wallet, that wallet was, you know, showing you, showing it as having no funds and you got really confused and you're like, what the hell? Why? I know I have Bitcoin here and it's not showing up. Um, so maybe you just, you know, you're not able to recover it. And so this tool is meant for people like that, that you get confused about, you know, which derivation pass you might have coins on. You're not sure where your coins are, if they're still there, um, and how to get them. And so he built a recovery tool that basically allows you to input seed words and it will tell you where your coins are and what kind of uh, scripts they're using and then allow you to recover it and at the moment I think um, he clarified it doesn't work for multi-sig it's only single sig but that's still really useful um, I can't remember I don't think it tells you which wallet you were using but he did um, in, in building this tool he did rely on the wallets recovery thing that Rodolfo and I've been working on basically figuring out what derivations uh, uh, different wallets use for different things, and it's a complete mess. Uh, it still is a complete mess. Um, so it won't tell you what wallet necessarily was used to generate it, but it will tell you the type of script um, that the coins are stored at and also the derivation path of where they are, and it will help you to recover those coins if you're not sure of how to do so. So that thing has been merged as of two days ago. There was a bit of a long waiting period while it was... The final reviews, but it has been merged. Woo! That should just straight up be a standard function in all wallets. Next up, let's get those derivation path descriptors. Mm -hmm. Chop, chop. Yeah, and no, a kind of related thing. I think it was um, Andrew Chow. He was asking... Who was it? I think he was asking... I can't remember. He was trying to figure out like, like um, why it might have even. Been, I think it was actually Trezor. He was asking Trezor mm -hmm. why they were referencing BIP thirty eight in their documentation when there actually is no BIP thirty eight, and it turns out that BIP thirty eight is just kind of it's it's the it's the derivation i think it's bip 38 um but basically that's what the multi hardware multi signature schemes use they kind of just laid claim to bip 38 even though there is no bip 38 so that was uh interesting and also once again confirms why why we should have built that guide because um even people who develop 
interfaces for hardware wallets and stuff. They're like, what? Or why are you referencing a bit that doesn't exist? Standards. Re. They're a thing for a reason. Yeah, I'm sure there's a there's a great ACD comic about standards. We should have a standard for these standards. Oh no. I know there's standards. standards. Yeah, it's just there there's a lot of silly shit like that that really does need to get cleaned up and standardized and references uh made in the appropriate places because that that's just kind of fucking silly at this point that all the hardware devices in the space um like a few of the early multi-sig wallets uh like did this and it's it's not even documented in a bip like come on Mm -hmm. Alrighty though i think that puts us at final thoughts time well my final thought is a congratulations to Bisk. Uh, they tweeted, I think it was August 19th, that they hit 70,000 trades um, all time as of the day before that, so August 18th. And that was six months after hitting 50,000. So they literally made 20,000 20, trades um, in a six-month period uh compared to 50,000 in their entire existence. So that is a big deal. Um and I think they highlighted that uh <laughs> they they said question why do you yanks charge so much of a premium on your bitcoin? Euro is much more friendly. Um yes, there is a massive premium on the USD bitcoin trades. Make that money. I mean, I I don't know. We uh we appreciate our freedom and independence here in this country much more than Europe apparently. I mean it is after yeah. all America. Yes, the the freedom and independence to have ATMs that KYC you up the ass and the freedom and independence to uh charge each other exorbitant premiums in your peer-to-peer -peer trades. Well, you sir want want your private bitcoin and I I want my fee for providing it. Well, it's kind of funny how if you want to get a KYC-free Bitcoin from a Bitcoin ATM, you probably have to go to Europe to get that. Yep. Find some shady ATM in a back alley somewhere that isn't legally supposed to be there. Uh, my friend, I, I can surprise you. Uh, there are KYC-free ATMs literally in um, internationally well-known um, accounting company buildings in their lobby that's not as cool as some grungy back alley somewhere that's not bitcoin no it's uh it's definitely, de definitely that's not, not on the streets punk. that is true it is it is not on the streets but um occasionally you can find a lot of street uh lurking its way into an office very unassumingly and it's far less noisy. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. I'm really struggling for a final thought here, so I'm just going to go derp. Well, I have another one. Um, it was BTC Pay Server's third birthday on August 18th, um, because... August 18, 2017 was the day that Nicholas Dorier said, This is lies. My trust in you is broken. I will make you obsolete to uh, BitPay. And oh boy, that has absolutely come true. <laughs> you know what? I want to gripe about turning everything in this space into a holiday, but not about this. Damn it. And my uh, final, final thought is um, I have found the perfect music video for uh, Money Printer Go Burr, which is Hard Fi's Cash Machine music video. Alrighty. Well, here, here, here's my final thought. I don't know. There, there were a few things uh, didn't make it onto the news desk this week uh, because Shinobi uh, got lazy and was bad at time management. But uh, I might do an orphan block to get in those or into those in the next day or two uh, i just need to let my brain reset
But uh, yeah. Toodles. Is it is it really an orf? Is it really an orphan block, or is it more like an uncle? How dare you! You you kicked off the show later, punks. I need I need to go through the firing process with Janine. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a voice for your head. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head. Yeah, you can have a voice for your head.